Welcome to the lecture on intercropping and disease control in this summer school turned winter school. My name is Maria Fink and I'm in the head of the Department of Ecological Plant Protection at the University of Kassel and um, would like to give you some input on the topic. I would like to give you some introduction on the mechanisms um, that work in diversified systems for disease control and would like to illustrate them with two case studies looking at induced resistance in the first one and then a case study on cultivar mixtures in China that also includes scale effects. In the end, I will finish up with some general thoughts on the future. Let's, um, the first thing I want to um, want you to consider is the question: What what are the types of monoculture that are pre that we are using in agriculture? All of you will be aware of species monocultures. Um, those are basically a species monoculture is an area planted to plants of the same species. The second type of monoculture that not everybody will be aware of, but that you should be aware of when we talk about resistance and diversification is the question of, are we using one or several variety? So within a species, we can use several varieties and then we may have diversity for resistances. Then we may also have, and this is even less commonly thought of, a monoculture of resistance. So there may be several different varieties, but still each variety may possess the same type of resistance. So it may look as if there's a diversity of varieties, but with, from the point of view of a pathogen that is adapted to a certain resistance, it may not be really a diversified stand. When we look at diversification in time and space, the general possibilities are um, in space, you can use different species. You can um, have different species in different fields. You can also have species um, within one field, but different species, and of course, using different varieties and resistances and also go all the way to intercropping. Varieties can also be diversified, as I pointed out. You may use um, variety mixtures, but you may also use multi-lines and also populations. But this is not the topic of this um, presentation, so you should just be aware that there's different ways of putting varieties together, and we may discuss that afterwards. Resistance genes may also be diversified, and that is basically when multi-lines are used or populations where the parents that have been used to put together these have been um, have different genetic backgrounds with respect to resistance. All this can be mixed within fields or within neighbor or neighboring fields can be diversified. When we talk about diversification in time, we talk about crop rotations, of course, using crops, cropping sequences to break disease cycles and improve soil fertility, and relay cropping. That is the intricate timing of crops within a seasonal within a season, thereby reducing crop free times. That means also partial intercropping. When we think about mechanisms of disease reduction through diversity, there are um, a number of mechanisms that have been identified and I have supplied a paper for you to read about that. And um, the commonly known ones are increased distance between plants of the same um, type of resistance and I'll show a picture about that. Barrier effects, also we look at that. Then I will show induced resistance and scale effects in the um, when I also discuss our case studies. I'm not covering in this lecture um, additional mechanisms such as co-evolutionary interactions, which is the adaptation of pathogens um, to their hosts over time, as there is not enough time for that, and selection effects, which means increases in avirulent and antagonistic pathotypes and strain, um, and also competitive effects among pathogen strains. 
Distance and barrier effects are very easily understood when one looks at a picture like that. On the top left, you see a normal field as we are all used to. You have all the plants are basically the same genotype, the genotype A, with the same type of resistance. And if a pathogen um, is adapted to this genotype and it um, reproduces, it will be able to infect all the neighboring plants no matter how far it flies, basically. If we reduce the density of the plants, take out every other plant, then part of the pathogens, part of the spores may fall to the ground because there is simply no plants for the spores to land on. So that's a typical dilution effect and a distance effect. Of course, normally we do not just increase the distance between plants, but we fill it up with other plants. And that is shown here when we put in genotype B in between um, the plants of the genotype A. Then any pathogen that is adapted to genotype A may not, um, if it falls then on the genotype B, cannot propagate. And that is also a very important point because there is a barrier effect of a genotype B that keeps the pathogens from traveling further that might have fallen onto the next genotype A if there had not been a barrier. So here we have dilution, distance and barrier effects at the same time. A problem when we look at cultivar mixtures as, the point, as pointed out here could be that pathogens over time may adapt. So if you look here a pathogen that carries only virulence A can attack um, genotype A. The one that carries virulence B can attack genotype B. However, pathogens that carry both virulences can attack both. And that means if we have adaptation and recombination in the pathogens, we may get adaptation to cultivar mixtures. So the question is always how long will distance and barrier effects work if there is also evolution. But as I pointed out before, this is not the topic of this lecture because it will take additional time. When we talk induced resistance, that is actually a mechanism that is very much favored through diversity. And I will show you um, in, a, in a minute an example that demonstrates that. Induced resistance can be provoked if an avirulent race of a pathogen lands on a plant that is resistant to that race and the plant's resistance reaction is then induced. If then, once the plant resistance has been induced, um, another pathogen lands on that plant, very often the resistance also works against those. And that means the plant will not only defend itself against the avirulent race, that cause the initial resistance reaction, but in general. This is more or less true and depends on the system, but in general, we have better resistance reaction. That means the plant will be able to defend itself against attack from other pathogens or races that arrive later. And so if we have many different pathogens around in the environment, then we usually have a lot more induced resistance than when we have very simplified pathogen populations. And I will show this in an example now. In the study that I present here, um, it has been summarized in um, the journal Agronomy in the year 2000, and it was done by French colleagues at um, INRA in, um, in Paris. And um, what they did to find out what is the role of induced resistance in cultivar mixtures, they produced different kinds of cultivar mixtures. The, they used a resistant variety and mixed it with a susceptible variety. In this case, the susceptible variety is called Sleipner. And then they marked all plants in the stand so they could actually follow the disease on Sleipner alone. And when they planted Sleipner alone, then they followed how much, um, how fast the yellow rust developed. So they inoculated. And then after six weeks, the disease started showing up. And you can see 13 weeks after inoculation, so three months later, they had about 80% of the leaf area was covered with yellow rust. That was a typical epidemic development on Sleipner when it was standing alone in a, in a pure stand. 
So it was inoculated with a single rust race that was virulent on Sleipner. So there was genetic uniformity on the host side and genetic uniformity on the pathogen side. In the second treatment, they mixed Sleipner with a resistant cultivar, a fully resistant cultivar. And again, they inoculated with the single rust race that can only attack Sleipner. So we have here still the curve for the pure stand that we just looked at. But in here, it, the disease is followed on Sleipner. And after 13 weeks, the disease on Sleipner was only about 40% compared to the roughly 80%. That means it's the dilution of Sleipner, it's the barrier effects of the resistant variety, and um, and the distance effects that reduce the disease on Sleipner in a mixture with a resistant variety if only one pathogen race was, uh, was around that could attack Sleipner. So overall, 57% less disease in the mixture without induced resistance, simple mixture effect. The next treatment, they mixed the cultivar Sleipner with a cultivar that was susceptible to a second rust race. So here we have the cultivar Sleipner. There is one race that can attack the cultivar Sleipner and another race that could um, not attack the cultivar Sleipner, but could attack the second variety. As the plants were marked, they could still follow the disease only on Sleipner. But in the system now, there were spores produced by the other variety, avirulent spores, and there were virulent spores produced on Sleipner that could attack Sleipner. And in comparison to the pure stand, the disease that developed on Sleipner was almost nil. There was 83% less disease in this treatment compared to the pure stand. If we put them all three together now, we have without induced resistance, if a single rust race was there, we had 57% disease reduction. If there was a mixture and two rust races were around and thus induced resistance could also contribute to the whole uh, disease development on Sleipner, there was 83% reduction. This is a very spectacular experiment and um, one of the few studies that very nicely shows the role of induced resistance when we talk cultivar mixtures and diversification. And I think it is very important that we are clear that there are many, many different factors um, contributing to um, disease reduction when we, do, when we diversify our stands. <clears throat> We have general effects of diversity on induced resistance to summarize. In diversified systems, we have a greater variety of pathogens, species and races present that thus allow for more effective triggering of induced resistance. And we have shown this in other systems that really it makes a difference if you test with one or several races at the same time. I now want to move to a case study on disease control in rice in China through mixing. This was very, um, this is a very famous study that has been published in Nature. And I want to quickly present what people have been doing. And then I want to have a closer look at the data because um, the data interpretation was um, a little bit special. And I want you to see what it means if we look in detail. Many years back in the late 1990s, colleagues um, in um, Kunming in southern China, they observed that farmers were not growing monocultures anymore of rice. And um, basically what they observed that people were growing mixtures. The mixtures were like strips. They had always two rows of hybrid rice. And in between, they grew every once in a while a row of a glutinous rice. The interesting thing about the system was the glutinous rice itself is not very productive. It is very susceptible to rice blast, which is a fungal disease, but it has a very good market value. The hybrid rice, in contrast, is very productive, is very little susceptible to rice blast, but it has a very low market value. 
And so it was very interesting for the researchers when they observed that farmers were actually producing the glutinous rice within the hybrid rice fields just by putting rows of glutinous rice in between. And so they asked the farmers to produce monoculture glutinous rice, monoculture hybrid rice and the mixtures as they usually do. This is what it looks like in the field. You have here the hybrids, they are dark green, and the monocultures that usually also, uh, and the glutinous rice that usually matures a little bit earlier and is also taller, as you can see. And so the, the way the people manage this is they plant them together and they harvest the glutinous rice by hand and later they come with the machines to harvest the hybrid. So what did that do? So the, in China, always studies are very big. They went to different sites and they had different areas, like here the area um, shipping in the year 1998 and the shipping in the year 1999, Jianchu in 1999. Um, and they used, actually they asked the farmers to use two glutinous varieties to test the system. And they also looked only at the disease on the glutinous varieties, either in monoculture, that's the yellow one, or when they were grown in mixtures. So you can see variety one was highly susceptible and had um, 20, between 20 or 10 or 35% neck blast. And neck blast is a very insidious disease that really kills the plants and make them, and, and a plant that is attacked by neck, neck blast will not produce any yield. So you can basically say 35% neck blast means 35% yield loss. Variety 2 was more resistant, but still showed up to 10% neck blast in the pure stands. When grown in the mixtures, however, neck blast almost disappeared. So they could observe there was overall 94% disease reduction in the susceptible varieties. And this was published in Nature. So let's look in detail at the data. How, how did they actually do that? In the pure stand of a glutinous rice, um, usually they grow 38 hills per square meter, so relatively dense. The hybrid variety is grown only with about 15 hills per square meter because they become, um, they, they produce more um, fertile seeds per head. And um, in the mixture, they use the 15 hills per square meter of the hybrid, and they add only one tenth of the hills of the glutinous. In the pure stand, as I said, 38. In the mixture, only 3.7. This is about um, one tenth of the density of the pure stand. So overall, it is an additive design. Now let's look at the yields. In shipping in 1998, the yield of the glutinous variety was 3.7 tons. In 1999, it was 4 tons. And in Jianchui in 1999, it was 5 tons. In contrast, the hybrids had always 8 to almost 10 tons yield in the pure stands. Looking at the mixtures, in some, um, between 8 and a little bit over 10 tons. And taking it apart, looking at how much is the glutinous rice and how much is the hybrid, you can see that the hybrids produced pretty much exactly what they produced in a monoculture. So 8.13 instead of 8.14, 8.34 instead of 8.41, 9.961 instead of 9.71. So 100 or 99% of the yield in the pure stand. The glutinous variety, in contrast, um, was grown at about 10% of the density. So the expected yield here would be 0.37 tons. But it was actually the observed yield 0.59. That's 73% more than expected. The, in shipping 99, actually, it was three times as high than expected. And in Chianchui 99, it was still 86% more than expected for the glutinous rice. And this is the reason why the farmers liked the system, because they could still produce their hybrid and could you, uh, produce, in addition, the glutinous variety at better yields than if they put the glutinous variety in the pure stand. And they do not lose any of the farming area. 
So, of course, this is very nice and it was published just like that in Nature. Now, let's look at the plausibility of the data. We have seen there's rows of susceptible plants are grown between strips of the resistant hybrid. Now, let's look at the panicle blast. In the pure stands, between 3 and 35% were attacked by panicle blast. And I just explained the panicle blast also causes about 100% yield loss on the plants that are affected. So that means if the highest panicle blast was 35%, the highest yield loss should have been about 35%. Now let's look at these percentages and this is getting a little bit more tricky. So if we have 35% panicle blast in a pure stand, then the yield is then, because we have 35% yield loss, only 65% of what we would have if there were no panicle blast. That's at least the assumption. So expected yield without disease is 100%. The maximum percent yield increase through disease reduction is 100 divided by 65 then, and this is 1.54, meaning the maximum percent yield increase through disease reduction is 50%. So, so that's what we can expect. But the overyielding that was reported was 73 to 200%. Let's go back to the table. We see here 73%, 200%, 86% over yielding. So what happened? It's not that the data are wrong, but the question is, what about the interpretation? And it took me a trip to China to actually see the fields to understand what happened. So. First of all, panicle blast can only cause maximum 35% yield loss, in most cases much less. This is the summary of what I just showed. So what are the, the mechanisms of the disease reduction that we see here? We have on the one hand distance effects. The susceptible plants are growing in large distance from each other. And we have microclimatic effects. Susceptible plants are taller, and that means they are drier and that should also reduce the blast. And there has been a paper a couple of years later that actually showed exactly that. But now I, for the first time, saw the pure stand of the susceptible plants. And what you see here is a traditional variety that is getting as much fertilizer as a hybrid variety in a pure stand. And what it does, it falls over. So we may have yield loss, not only because of the disease that is higher in there, but we also have yield loss because of the lodging. So when we grow mixtures, the susceptible plants are kept from lodging because simply on the one hand, the hybrids are taking up a lot of the nutrients. On the other hand, the hybrids are standing next to the tall plants and probably keeping them from falling over. There is no overnutrition of the tall plants and they are basically fenced in and supported by the neighbors. And in this way, also the susceptible plants can better make better use of the excess fertilizer that normally in the pure stand, they simply fall over. In a, that means Altogether, disease reduction and the fact that the susceptible variety can tolerate the high end inputs leads to the spectacular yield increases. So what does it mean? The data are still impressive, but an agroecological perspective helps to increase the plausibility of the interpretation and shows that things are highly complex. No matter what you interpret, but still the success of the system has been very good. By growing the majority of an area with mixtures, the inoculum pressure was much reduced overall and disease in mixtures reduced by over 90%. This is also a scale effect, actually. 
Then the area grown to mixtures was expanded to over 40,000 hectares in 2000, in the year 2000, and more than 1 million hectares in 2005. I do not know how big the area is by now. The farmers stopped applying fungicides because they didn't need them anymore. Many old varieties that had been thought lost are cultivated again, and farmers even grow fish in their fields again. Of course, I could give many more examples of studies that have sh has looked at um, diversification and what it does to diseases. However, we do have serious time constraints. I just want to give a little bit of an outlook of what we need to look at and think about when we want to diversify. One is the practicability of mixtures in the field. Will it require hand labor or not? And there it is very interesting to look at the work in Wageningen that has been done with strip, strip intercropping by the group of Dirk Appeldorn. Because this work actually has um, shown that even when you work with machine width strips, a lot of disease reduction can be obtained. Um, the second part is when we do real mixtures, meaning not cultivar mixtures, but species mixtures, can we sow it together? Can we harvest it together? And do we have to sort out the mixture in the end? And what is the cost of that? And does it pay? If we do mixtures, we also have to see if the market will accept them. Some of them, some mixtures are easy to use. If we use cultivars of cereals that are similar in quality, usually they can be used for baking bread without a problem. However, that does not mean that the market will accept them. So there is some work to be done with the millers and the bakers. However, I would like to point out that cereals are usually mixed by the millers in order to produce the required quality for the bakers. So it's a matter of, um, of agreements and um, acceptance. Other mixtures are maybe more difficult. However, um, for animal feed, it's of course not such a big problem. If we do species mixtures, it's yet a different thing. Think about mixing cereals and a legume, a grain legume, which is wonderful for yield and usually also very good for quality of the cereals. It can increase the baking quality. The question is, how clean do the cereals have to be in order to make bread? Of course, we know that a little bit of legume seed, peas or beans inside the cereals um, actually it does not even compromise the taste of the cereal uh, and of the bread that comes out. But still, millers and bakers have to be able to deal with it and to accept it. And then it has to be also told to the consumers that this is a different bread, that there is some residues of legumes in it. Could use that um, as an argument for increasing the protein content or you could use it as an argument that it is contaminated. It's just a matter of viewpoint. The last and very important question is, what kind of investments are needed? If we add new crops into the rotation or new crops as mixtures, um, that usually comes along with costs in machinery, costs in planning, and if then diversification even is taken to another level by bringing in animals into the system, then um, it can get too costly. However, there we could also talk about collaboration on the farm level. Animal farmers do and could collaborate with um, arable farmers in order to diversify what do the arable farmers grow and also help for better animal nutrition with locally produced feed. We need to work on the technology for mixed cropping and product separation and especially species mixtures. And we also need to work for breeding for diversity within species maybe. And we may want to work for breeding for mixing ability among species. All these topics would go, I could give a whole course on this, but this is not the topic right now. With this, I would li like to finish and um, open for the discussion.